All right, and welcome back to Red Thread Podcast. I'm your host, Randy, and uh, today I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I'm going to post this video up on my Odyssey channel, uh, so you'll want to go over to odyssey.com, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com, uh, at Rand, or, no, no, at Red Thread Podcast. There we go. Okay, anyway, um, I'll probably throw it up on YouTube, too. The reason that I want to be doing some video stuff is because uh, it's easier for me to be able to do some research, dig into some things, and throw some theories around this way, uh, you know, as opposed to like a standard uh, podcast kind of format. And um, lately, I haven't been getting enough research in to my liking, but I still want to keep everybody out there included with, uh, you know, some of the insight that I'm... Uh, digging into here. So uh, moving on. Um, today, I want to look at uh, a couple of things. Uh, we're starting off with 1816, the year without a summer. Okay. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the coldest in recent history, supposedly, um, also known as 1800 and froze to death. So, you know, it, it's just interesting that we have these um, periods of time with like really, really cold winters, another of which is in 1717. I found it interesting that, uh, you know, in 1816, almost exactly 100 years after the 1717, uh, which caused like the, the famine in Ireland and so on. So looking at these like abnormalities in temperature and uh, like around the world, um, you know, there's a lot of different theories as far as like why, uh, you know, this may have happened, was it a volcano uh, in uh, the Mount Tambora volcanic eruption is what it's generally kind of given to us as an explanation for this year without a summer. And this is in Indonesia. Okay. And um, if you're able to uh, go over to odyssey.com and take a look, you'll be able to see the video that I'm sharing right now. And so it's a uh, it's down near, ba near, near Bali, okay? So supposedly this thing pumped out enough ash to, you know, go around the world and cause this, you know, summer of darkness, okay? So uh, we're talking food shortages across the Northern Hemisphere, uh, an absolute agricultural disaster. So um, North America, Western Europe, Asia, and China, but not Russia, Okay. So that's the interesting thing about this is it's not included in Russian history. So uh, this there there's a scale of this disaster is just epic, right? There's even like like poems and stuff written about it. Um, one of which I want to read off to you folks here uh, because it's just very strange. Okay, it's the year without a summer, and it's called darkness. And uh, see if I can remember where the poem is. Here we go. Okay, this is interesting to me um, because the weirdest things about this 1816 year without a summer are some of the art that came from it, like this Lord Byron, uh, also known as George Gordon, wrote this poem, Darkness, and, and it goes, I had a dream which was not at all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread. Of this their desolation, and all hearts were chilled to a selfish prayer for light, and they did live by watchfires, and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons, cities were consumed, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. Happy were those who dwelt within the eye of volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash, and all was black. The brows of men by the despairing light wore an earthly aspect as by fits the flashes fell upon them, some lay down and hid their eyes and wept, and some did rest, their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled, and others hurried to and fro and fed their funeral piles with fuel and looked up with mad disquietude on the dull sky. 
the pall of a past world, and then again, with curses cast them down upon the dust, and gnashed their teeth, and howled. The wild bird shrieked, and terrified did flutter on the ground, and flapped their useless wings. The wildest brutes came tame and tremulous, and vipers crawled, and twined themselves among the multitude hissing, but stingless. They were slain for food, and war, which for a moment was no more. Did glut himself again, a meal was bought with blood, and each sate sullenly apart. Gorging himself in gloom, no love was left. All earth was but one thought, and that was death, immediate and inglorious. And the pang of famine fed upon all entrails. Men died, and their bones were tombless as their flesh. The meager by the meager were devoured. Even dogs assailed their masters, all save one. And he was faithful to a course, and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay. Till hunger clung them, or the dropping dead lured their lank jaws. Himself he sought out no food, but with a piteous and perpetual moan, and a quick desolate cry licking the hand, which answered not with a caress, he died. The crowd was famished by degrees, but two of an enormous city did survive, and they were enemies. They met beside the dying embers of an altar place, where had been heaped a mass of holy things, for an unholy usage they'd racked up. And shivering scrapped with their cold skeleton hands, the feeble ashes and their feeble breath, blew for little life, and made a flame, which was a mockery. And then they lifted up their eyes as it grew lighter, and beheld each other's aspects, saw and shrieked and died. Even of, on their, of their mutual hideousness they died, unknowing who he was upon whose brow famine had written fiend, and the world was void. The populace and the powerful was a lump, seasonless, herbless, treeless, manless, lifeless, a lump of death, a chaos of hard clay. The rivers, lakes, and ocean all stood still, and nothing stirred within their silent depths. Ships sailorless lay rotting in the sea, and their masts fell down piecemeal as they dropped. They slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead. The tides were in their grave. The moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. Darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe. Okay, that's some pretty heavy stuff, right? Like incredibly heavy stuff. Now, I'm under, in my opinion, you know, art generally will mimic reality. Okay. You're not going to write this. You know, you might write it as a premonitory thing, like if you had a vision or something, but otherwise, why would you write something this dark unless this had actually happened? Okay. Um, keep in mind, right around this period of time, you had a lot of really dark writings coming, coming out, you know, you had Frankenstein, um, you know, you had a lot of really heavy, dark stuff. And, you know, it seems to me that, that you would have an influence for all of this darkness in the arts, right? Um, one of my hypotheses or my thoughts is war, massive, massive wars everywhere for probably the better part of the last 500 years. Um, that the, uh, you know, the order that we have in place now is, has been at this for a very long time. Okay. And, uh, so the revolutionary war was not our, we did not win this as, as you know, your average run of the mill person. Okay. Slavery was not abolished during the civil war. Okay. It was shifted. It was changed. The methodology behind it changed. Okay. So that being said, in this war, amidst this war, right, the early 1800s, we know there was war going on. We have Napoleon, so on and so forth, all within this like 15 or 20 years, all this madness, earthquakes, all kinds of stuff. And in 1816, uh, in Geneva, uh, there was the reason it was called a year without a summer is because, of course, you know, there was frosts in the middle of the summer uh, and there was as it says, uh, as strange weather and an inexplicable darkness caused record cold temperatures across Europe, especially in Geneva. That's kind of strange, you know, especially in Geneva, Switzerland, and 
then after after this this time period, you know, the Swiss bank comes around, becomes the IMF and all this other crazy stuff happens. But all that aside, like uh, there was a celebrated dark day, a celebrated dark day. That's the weird thing, too. Like in Geneva, there was a celebrated dark day. Like so, I mean, was this what caused the, the absolute fall of the previous empire? Like did, were they not able to predict this? Um, was there a massive shift of like people, you know, changing their allegiances, things like this, or were they just in the middle of a war? And was this darkness a byproduct of that war, of a major, major, just catastrophic series of events? I don't think it was one event, okay? Uh, because we have this thing happening all around the world. We have these conflagrations, and if you look up the meaning of the word conflagration. Uh, the second meaning after a big fire is a conflict or war, okay? So they are effectively telling us what was going on, okay? This was a massive worldwide war prior to the world wars, okay? This is what my research is showing me. And when you start looking at massive warring areas, what you have is you have devastation, not just to that local area, but if you're trying to feed your armies and things like this, you're going to ravage the local forests. You're going to, you know, not want people coming at you from the forests, um, you know, to attack you. So you're going to set fire to these forests. You're going to burn everything down. And why that concept resonates or one of the reasons that concept resonates with me is because of the fact that you have stories and it's going to sound crazy but like lord of the rings right where evil starts up in the east burns down all of these you know lush lands and forests right um i mean dude you can even go so far as to look at shrek with the decimating of the fairy tale creatures and everything so to do that they would just burn the forests down right so yet a lot of this transition going on at this time it went from very fantastic and medieval with you know maps with with different beings and creatures and you know books written uh regarding different creatures and and different things that existed and then you have these these events um kind of starting around around from what i see you know around the early 1500s when this current history kind of starts to go into place you start seeing the history of of post it's they call it like post uh post-crusade kind of medieval time, right? Um, personally, I don't believe that the, the crusade happened as we are told it happened. I don't think the timeline is correct. Um, but, you know, once you've effectively decimated the old civilization, then you're free to rewrite the timeline and the history however you want, okay? And that's just what happens. But anyway, getting further into this uh, year without a summer, uh, a scientist apparently in Italy even predicted that the sun would go out on the 18th of July, shortly before Byron's writing of darkness. His prophecy caused riots, suicide, and religious fervor all over Europe. Uh, for example, a bath girl woke her aunt and shouted at her that the world was ending, and the woman promptly plunged into a coma. In Liege, a huge cloud in the shape of a mountain hovered over the town, causing alarm among the old women, who expected the end of the world on the 18th. In Ghent, a regiment of cavalry passing through the town during a thunderstorm blew their trumpets, causing three-fourths of the inhabitants to rush forth and throw themselves on their knees in the streets, thinking they had heard the seventh trumpet. Okay, so think about this. If you are at war and you can create an event that is going to have that effect on people, that is going to cause them to flee into the streets and surrender, okay, after you've been at war for probably the better part of 100 years throughout the throughout the world and, and we're talking for for people that want to pigeonhole it to something we're talking about the end and the fall of tartaria as it's known by people in the world now now tartaria was only a small piece of this world conglomerate okay the old loose corporation of states okay of city states medieval style city states that were everywhere each being independent and this is back when humanity, people, we were sovereign in a sense, in a sense. Now I say in a sense, because yes, we were sovereign humans. 
We didn't maybe have other humans controlling us, but we had what we knew as gods controlling us. And we were more than happy to be of service to the gods, right? Okay, so something happened. We started to disagree with the these uh, larger peoples, uh, you know, that were kind of holding the reins, who had the technology, who had the information. Um, or maybe it was something like after, you know, humanity, a group of humanity, maybe the really old school kind of Freemasons, you know, had accumulated enough of the knowledge, figured out enough of how to go about, you know, retaliating, fighting back, turning on the new world order, right? Uh, and so they did, and it and it took a lot of time. You know, they started obviously uh, in the east. Um, you know, the fact that the Great Wall of China was facing the portals are facing the wrong way for attacking. Uh, you know, the the Mongols it, it says really all you need to know. Okay, there was a massive effort to defend against this power that was building in the east. That formally was called Katai, okay? Um, and this was possibly due in part to Jesuit or, um, we'll call it Jesuit or, or you know, Black noble, Black brother, or what do you call it? Black nobility influence, right? Um, and, and these were maybe a number of different families, uh, you know, a number of different groups of people that set out for an agenda. Um, that were not happy apparently with the way that the world was being run or they just wanted to be in charge. I mean, we see what people do to each other nowadays. Right. So um, personally, I'm getting more and more comfortable with understanding and knowing that there was a unified humanity, so to speak, there was a unity consciousness like Michelle Gibson puts it. I think that's a beautiful way to understand it. Um, that, you know, everybody, was proud, was thoughtful, was, was, you know, composed. Um, we didn't have all these heavy metals and all this thing, but anyway, I'm like digressing way off the point here. Uh, I just wanted to kind of present some of this research uh, that I'm putting here, but anyway, so this is like a biblical event, right? I mean, causing people to rush out into the streets and throw themselves down thinking they'd heard the end of the world. Okay. Was this by design? I personally, I think so, but here's the interesting part. Uh, they, the search for the cause of the strange changes in the light of day only grew as scientists discovered sunspots on the sun so large that they could be seen with the naked eye. Now, here's what's interesting about that. If you're into the plasma universe hypothesis, much as I am, you know, I see the world as energy. I understand what's going on. It makes sense to me, you know, for the most part. Um, the sun is an energy tr transformer, Okay. It is bringing in a certain type of energy and putting out another. It's a large torus. And you can see that when you look at like the magnetic sphere of the sun, even in a diagram, you could see it's a magnetic torus, much like the earth, much like everything. Okay. Everything is its own micro macro toroidal field, even us as humanity. Okay. So if you are privy to the circuit that is this world, Right. And, and it is it very much is. And this is what the old civilization, the old humanity was tuned into what their technology was keyed into um, was the energy of of the Taurus, of, of the entire, you know, field of this earth, of the, you know, of the sun. They were using not just um, there's a difference in charge between the earth and the sun. And that's what causes the energy flow. OK, that's the easiest way I can put it for you. So if you have changes in the sun, uh, you know, magnetic changes in the sun, you're going to have a direct result on the land. But what is causing this energy flux? What is causing this change? Okay. Was it that there was, and this is my theory, that there were electromagnetic weapons, okay, being wielded during this per period of time, energy weapons being wielded using the power of the sun, the earth, the moon, so on, okay, causing a disruption in this circuit, creating magnetic, you know, changes, making sunspots on the sun, right? So 
these sunspots are 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 they they represent to announce that a general removal of heat from the globe. If you don't have the sun shining, you're not warming the the earth. And here, here furthermore, in this poem, as it's talking about the tides standing still, right? It's talking about a lot of different things that end of days ish. But if you look at this as an electric circuit, you look at this world we live in as an electric circuit. And if you have the sun and the moon as plasma entities or, or plasma effects, okay, rotating above, right? There's an energy kind of balance going on. There's a dance going on with all these energies. If you are able to interject enough and disrupt enough, you could very well upset the balance to where the sun basically shorts out, turns off, okay? So if you are pulling enough of this energy through these, the circuit for your own means, could you possibly be causing this end of days type of scenario? Um, was this the last ditch effort of the empire before to scrap everything, bury everything, and not give it to these controlling classes that are currently in place. Personally, I kind of think so. Um, and, you know, that kind of digs into the possibility of like, all right, where did these people go who... Anyway, um, so that being said, the, the sun went out, which is interesting, um, or darkened. Now, um, what's interesting about this is there's no reports of that in Siberia, okay? Um, no reports about that in Siberia, no Russian kind of things going on. But we have a situation 200 years ago also in the Siberian forests where, you know, uh, all of the trees in Siberia are 200 years old max. Okay. So that being said, um, just a moment. I'll be off in a bit. Thank you for your patience. But anyway, um, Russian Siberia, 200 year old trees, they're digging up stumps, uh, here and and just for those out there looking listening wanting to read into this information um i'm pulling this up off of a, for, a forum at stolenhistory.net so go take a look over there uh it's free to sign up and and there's tons of information on there um and it's just i'm able to kind of go with the flow of of where the threads are taking me i understand that you know when information is presented no matter what a lot of the times there's a purpose for presenting that information out in forums and things like that but going along with it, there's no suggestion in any of these that these things are that I'm talking about are man-made in any way, shape, or form. There's a lot of suggestion to comets, a lot of suggestion to meteorites. Uh, the Tunguska event is, a, is an example of something that happened there. Um, but you, you have to think, okay, if we're looking at 200-year-old trees in... Uh, Okay, this is in 1908, and I'm pulling up a picture for those of you that are listening. A 1908 Tunguska meteor, and you can see how small these trees all are that are knocked down here. Okay, so that's suggesting that, you know, and this is the, how the trees used to be. And they have a pocket of very large redwoods in California. There are no very large trees left in Siberia, though. Okay, so, so that's interesting in itself. So there's a lot of old growth forests that are just gone. Okay, they're just gone. They don't tell us where these went. They don't tell us why everything's covered in mud. They don't tell us where all of the coal underneath our feet came from. And this, for me, for what my theory is on where the coal came from, where all the oil came from, we had a previous, you know, environment that was very rich and lush. And this could have been, you know, the flood we know as Noah's flood when everything got buried underneath, you know, tons of ocean silt, right? And then if you combine that with a plasma event, that means that you could create, you know, hydrocarbons and things like this very quickly, not over the millions of years, like we're told, okay? 
And I think that these, these, you know, controllers, these, you know, big oil, you know, robber barons, I think that these people, they know that they know that all they have to do is create a biomass large enough, which is what they're doing here in the Midwest. Every year they till under the ground, the biomass, and they stack up on top of it the following year. Okay. And they keep doing that and they keep doing that over and over and over again. All right. And so they're, they're artificially building this biomass uh, here in the Midwest. And that's going to be the next field of oil. Watch maybe not in our lifetime, definitely not in my lifetime. Okay. But you're, you're going to see uh, coming, coming out, you know, information, especially if you're open to, to seeing it and looking for it, that the, the fossil fuel compounds are very easily made in a lab with electricity and and carbohydrates okay ask me how i know that because it makes sense to me um so go look into that yourself if you want to dig into how that makes sense okay but if you knew you had a buried biomass and you wanted to create a product and this is like like beyond controller, this is probably up like Anunnaki level type stuff, right? <laughs> like beyond the control, the controlling of the controllers kind of thing. So this is known by something out there, okay? That if you apply electricity to a buried biomass, you will create, a, you know, fossils, right? Very quickly, you will create fossil fuels very quickly. This can be reproduced in the lab, okay? So don't take my word for it. Go research some stuff on your own. And, uh, you know, see what you find. All right. So back to the year without a summer, if you have in Siberia, you have, uh, or in Russia, especially in Russia, right around 1812, 1811, what do we have? We have tales of comets. We have tales of conflagrations. Lots of things are popping off at this period of time. Um, we also had Napoleon going through Russia and sacking and burning entire vast swaths of Russia and Siberia. So if you have an army or, you know, a force moving through an area, okay, needing to eat, needing to stay warm, needing all of these things, they're going to decimate the wildlife. And if you are taking over this vast expanse here, uh, formerly Tartaria, and you are the Napoleonic army, going in here with based on my research the napoleonic army had a lot more technology available to them than we're allowed to understand okay they had flying ships they had archimedean rays and you know people often doubt very very highly the magnitude of uh you know of a of a, a beam of energy that you can get from the sun and focus and bring down to earth in its own you know very tight wavelength if you can manage that, you can definitely pack a major punch with something that's effectively a magnifying glass to an ant, okay? As long as you're able to focus those beams together, and you would only need mirrors, you know? And if you have airships in place, and you're good at mathematics, and you can figure out where to put these mirrors and how to, how to angle them together and collect the beam in one place, you can lay waste to things, okay? Um, people need to understand how much energy is actually coming out of the sun and is in this circuit. And furthermore, if you have access to the ability to harness the EMF properties of the sun and, and of, you know, uh, the standing wave phenomenon that happens when you increase elevation and so forth, if you can create a closed loop in that circuit, you can create an arc. That arc will then snap and destroy. If you want an idea of what that might look like, very recently, we had an issue where the Georgia Guidestone just kind of exploded. Now, the current, you know, thing about that is, well, yeah, you know, but we found somebody's driver's license, you know, at the scene. Of course they did. Of course they did. Right. But anyway, you'll see in that film, it's just a snap, like less than a frame. There's a, lot, a bright flash and the thing is just falling apart on the ground. Okay. So, you know, don't discount direct energy weapons. That gets into the fascists and things like that. And in another time, we'll get into that. But 1816, okay. Um, something very interesting also about that period of time is that right in the same period of time where we have this year without a summer, 
we have, you know, Napoleon going into Russia and, and trying to take out stuff over there, laying waste to vast quantity, vast areas. Okay. So, you know, we don't really know what the real story is, who was battling, who, who was overtaking, who we only have one side of the story. But if you look at some like inferences, and if you're willing to infer on something uh, based on popular culture and media and things that were sold, you know, uh, again, look at Shrek, you know, the decimation of, you know, they're, they're like, all right, we're going to take out, you know, the ogre swamps and all this other stuff. So if you had a people hell bent on destruction, going around the world and removing what the old world was and what that entails is pretty, pretty amazing. You know, um, maybe dinosaurs being one of those cover stories to cover up for, you know, creatures that were here. Now, here's another thing. If you had a higher oxygen content in the atmosphere, say, say it wasn't that long ago, but you are constantly creating electric events right? Which cause ionization of the atmosphere, right? Which breaks oxygen into ozone, right? You would then have what we grew up understanding as the ozone layer. That ozone layer wasn't a natural thing. It is the result of an energetic event or more than one, possibly many. Okay. And you know, I, I think that a, a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, a lightning strike doesn't cause that much damage. I mean, a lightning strike is a natural discharge. If you are able to, you know, contain and, and have capacitors and things accumulate enough energy and then release that energy at once. And if you look at some of the old world structures, they scream capacitor. Okay. Like, like this whole, they could have used the entire old world structure against itself to a certain degree. Okay. Um, but, you know, something to keep in mind is, is that uh, there's a reason that we're all kept in the dark about energy and the way that it works. Um, some of us are, are fortunate to, to kind of be able to feel out what's BS and what's not. Um, you know, personally, I can read about something like the compound mercury and see through the mathematical equations, how it's absorbing and holding the energy and then releasing it at a specified time uh, and a specified frequency. Okay. So there's a lot of these things of the, the way the energy works that we're just not privy to, unless you're an electrical engineer. I'm not saying that I am. I'm just saying that I've done enough looking into it, that it, it kind of makes sense to me. Okay, and if you have technology and you think about the size of technology that maybe had existed prior to, you know, the current industrial age, right? We're talking steam, you know, engines, uh, free wheels that are the size of, you know, large homes spinning away, you know, perpetual energy devices, things like this. You can create a massive amount of energy. And if you have a way to store that energy, it could be a very devastating thing. And that's just one, one kind of thing. And the other side of things is sound, right? Like if you have these trumpets, right? The people have been so scared of, maybe they had heard these trumpets before, you know, maybe they had seen what happened and, and how things became decimated when they heard these sounds come from the heavens, right? So we've got like crazy sounds coming from the heavens. We've got conflagrations, which are also meaning war. Okay. We have the Siberian forest that's only 200 years old, okay? And moving on from there, we have a vast stretch of desert in Africa known as the Sahara. Just a massive desolate waste, right? And uh, the, the age of the Sahara supposedly is some like 3 million years old. But here's where you run into problems with that. And it's, you know, you'd be like, oh, no, that's just somebody's idea of what the world really looked like. Okay, maybe, right? But we're going to go look at Africa on a map here. This is in 1570, okay? 1570, guys. Look at this. And for those of you that are listening, uh, go take a look over on my Odyssey channel. Uh, but you can, again, go take a look on StolenHistory.net. Tons of information there. And you're going to see throughout Africa. Little red castles 
all over here and they're not just up along the you know the nile delta they're out in what in the middle of is now desert okay and it does say desert it does say uh what does it say some kind of desert but see there's only a little small area of desert here right in the middle kind of by nubia but north of of this tropic of cancer it's pretty lush looking there's tons of cities uh you know even in the very middle of the desert there's these massive cities uh, or at least you know fortifications or castles or you know whatever but there's tons of it there okay and we also see in a, a 19 or sorry 1595 map um you know we see this different political division of these maps right after the 1400s um and the other thing yeah i wanted to show is is the craters and we'll get to those the craters all throughout africa um but i mean in 1658 we have this map of africa that has just tons and tons of provinces um Numbia is to the north now which is interesting so things are moving around uh libya the interior we have elephants throughout here so this is a little bit more modern here um but what's interesting is you know it's pretty accurate on the islands right off the coasts and everything very interesting stuff and it shows the africans as black now that's something that may not actually be right this is right around the time after they supposedly discovered america so you know it's going to be a little different but anyway you see a rediscovery right around 1800 of africa that's the part i was trying to drive at 1782 everything's mapped out boom go to 1802 half of africa is unmapped once more and you know the logos and stuff for for africa down here uh you know pyramids and mummies and stuff so there was a purposeful forgetting of africa right around the turn of the 1800s this would have been from what i'm picking up everybody right at the tail end of the actual what i'm going to call from this point forward the revolution okay the world revolution was underway um when napoleon finished you know heading east into russia in the early 1800s 1812 1813 that would have been the end of the revolution okay and guess what everybody we did not win <laughs> okay that would be the end of the revolution the the re-scripting had basically been completed which is why you see works of literature starting to come out in the early 1800s so on and so forth they had to rebuild everything everything that they had just destroyed so that's the part of the story that we don't get okay that's the part of the story we don't get and um again 1812 africa vast quantities of area that are unknown the desert goes far to the north now and it's just insane. Eight, by 1842, they have it all remapped. Now, the desert has slid north, which is strange, right? Kind of weird. Weird stuff. Desert slid north. Uh, and uh, then all the way to... What's interesting here is... Wow, what, what year is this map? This is the earliest map on, that's on here. I don't know the exact year, uh, but it's called Prioris Hemispheri totuesque geographic key okay and you can find us again stolenhistory.net go check some resources over there but in this map they have the north pole complete with four subcontinents okay africa is green this is an actual topographical map all of africa is green full of rivers everywhere full of rivers Let's see if i can't zoom in here a little bit further See, the nice thing is on my phone i can zoom in further but i can't hear but anyway so go take a look at this map prioris hemispheriae totuesque geographici okay and there's tons of little cities all sprinkled through here i mean they're all named differently than they are now okay and of course i can't find the date on that one but you know what i know it's at over here somewhere but anyway so in order for an entire desert to move you know north by a thousand miles what would that take well you're looking at it these are massive massive craters okay in the sahara desert one of which is called the eye of the sahara and 
Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. Go take a look on Google Earth and you'll see what I mean. Now, these craters are massive, right? And they are all over Africa. There's a small map right here uh, that you can take a look at. And it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 massive craters in Northern Africa that is now desert. Okay. And then in Southern Africa, there's several more in the, in the desert area down at that end. So what happened here? I don't know. Was this possibly nuclear? I don't know. An energetic event of some kind? Yes. Okay. And you know, once you start to recognize what, what just being able to store and, and discharge enough energy would do, you could end up with craters much like these from an energetic strike or even a kinetic bombardment. Okay. Some of you may have heard of these things called rods from God that supposedly are in orbit. Uh, even if they're not in orbit and they're just up, you know, floating in the atmosphere with a mercury vortex engine waiting to drop something from 550 miles up where the sun and the moon actually exist, that would still do a devastating amount of damage. On top of that, they also have these bombs called the SAR, okay? And they leave massive, massive craters. They're uh, essentially, it's like a fuel air explosion. So it's like the explosion that happens in your, in your vehicle when your gas is being burned, but just to an extremely massive scale. So this is, to me, this is telling. This is 100% telling that this happened sometime after that map was written in the 1500s that showed all of Africa as populated and as lush and green, okay? Um, and let's see here. Let's go take a look and see what that time period was on that map here. Um, and it doesn't have the time period on the map. Oh, 1592. Okay, there we go. 1592. Good deal. I'm really glad that that, that popped back up. But it's like I said, it has, uh, it has the North Pole with the four little continents up there and everything. Um, it even shows the uh, like New York kind of peninsula over here in America. It shows a little bit of the Amazon. It's a very weird projection. So, you know, that's cool. But um, so, you know, seeing that, seeing that massive desert right like and seeing all of those craters and then you have the desert surrounding it and we see the decimation of places like like egypt right this definitely was decimated at one point we see the destruction have i mean iran and iraq's just wasteland it's just mass desert right and there's even more desert you know out in the tartarian area we have the gobi desert we have the polar arctic right all in the north up there uh you know, both above, uh, but above Russia and above America, we have this like Arctic kind of desert, right? And that's it's very flat and marshy, pockmarked, full of holes. Now we're told that it was all ice that did all of this damage, right? But how do you explain that in Africa? How do you explain that, like down in in like Patagonia, down in the, the southern end of you know South America? How do you explain you know Middle America? Um, and how do you explain there not being any, you know, recognition of, of the, um, of the Grand Canyon prior to like the early 1800s. So that's interesting. Now, if you had this massive worldwide thing going on where other weapons than we were privy to understand about were being used, that would explain a lot of what is going on. Okay. Um, and, you know, desert can be translated to waste, right? Waste or wilderness, right? So also as a verb, it means to withdraw from or leave, usually without intent to return. Huh, interesting. To leave in the lurch, to abandon without leave. So were these places purposefully evacuated you know, them seeing that, hey, we need to bounce out of here. This is going badly for us. Um, you know, there's a hypothesis in the flat earth circles that 
there is more land out here. There is, uh, you know, uh, Lemuria still exists, basically. Um, Atlantis might be still exists. And this hypothesis is based on the moon map. The, um, in my opinion, the fact that when you look up at the full moon, you are seeing a projection of what is below. Okay, it's an inverted projection uh, bounced off of the energetic layer that is the firmament, giving it depth. Um, I know that sounds crazy to most people, but I mean, when you see video games, you play RPGs, you always have a mini map in the top corner and all this and that. And this is the most lifelike RPG ever, you know, and they've got this little map up there for you. Like, I mean, come on. I don't know what else to tell people other than everything that we've been sold throughout our entire life is bogus. So you've got to come to your own conclusions. It's got to make sense to you. Um, and, you know, maybe you'll agree with some of the things that other people have put out there. Maybe you won't. Um, I think it's incredibly fishy that desert or desert means to withdraw from or leave, usually without intent to return. So was this culture that was in all of these areas that are now desert, um, you know, could it have been known as Tartaria? Maybe, you know, I don't know. You know, we see um, flags of California. Some of them have the, the, the owl of Tartaria, you know. Um, you know, this land bridge uh, up here was supposedly still, you know, connected. And, you know, I'm sure that if you lower the water level a bit, it would be connected still, right? Um, but if you have the capability to carve out fast swaths of land with an energetic device or a sonic device, which most likely, in my opinion, is something to the effect of why California is not... Uh, you know, set as an island anymore. Um, so, you know, that's just the thought. But but anyway, um, you, you just have this, this massive decimation of areas. Um, I mean, there's tons of maps out there like this, guys, that, that have, you know, the earth very green and lush and full of vast forests and, you know, uh, unexplored land and, and things like this. And, uh, you know, we know there were large beasts in the past. We've We've got some fossilized things, you know, that are probably legit. Um, but I think the context that they're all put in is just just not quite right. But so that's going to gonna wrap it up here for this uh, little episode here. And, uh, you know, we'll dig into some more stuff next time. Thanks, everybody. Oh, well, if I can figure out how to unrecord. <laughs> anyway. Um, much love, everybody. Thank you for tuning in uh, for another episode. And go check it out over on Odyssey, guys. I'm going to start putting some stuff up there. It's just easier for me to research this stuff, get these thoughts out, and share them with you all. All right.